The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Can democracy thrive or even persist if citizens can't agree on which facts are, in fact, facts? Tonight, as part of our joint initiative between the Toronto Star and TVO, we'll take on the problem that a post-truth world presents to democracy. First up, author and legal scholar Cass Sunstein cautions against the need to censor views that may not pass the truth test. Then we'll explore the implications of such dissonance for democratic politics. It's Thursday, April 1st, an appropriate day to talk about post-truth. And that's next on The Democracy Agenda. Let's say a high-profile, democratically elected political figure lies routinely. Let's say the people around that person also lie, frequently and openly, and that their supporters, too, take up those lies. Should something, somehow, be done to stop them? Cass Sunstein is the Robert Walmsley University professor at Harvard and author most recently of Liars, Falsehoods and Free Speech in an Age of Deception. And he joins us now from the U.S. Capitol on why he argues that, in general, lies should not be censored or regulated. Cass Sunstein, it's good to have you on the program again. How are you doing? Hey, pleasure to be here. Not at all. Given that you're in Washington, perhaps it's uh, reasonable for us to start by invoking the name of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, that great senator who once said everyone's entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. Now, given the landscape in your country these days, is it fair to say not too many people are listening to that advice? Well, I think people think that they are truthful about facts, most of them, not all. And so they believe they're saying what's uh, not false, but often they are saying falsehoods. Right now, a lot of people in your country are shouting falsely, fire in a crowded movie theater. You talk about this in the book. Why so many and why now? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, of course, is the proliferation of outlets in which you can find things that are false. So if you go on Twitter or Facebook, or if you go on a website, you can hear things about Martians or about uh, pandemics that aren't true or about other members of the human species that are false. So it's just so easy to find falsehoods. And often, if you hear something that's false from someone you believe to be credible, it might be your neighbor, might be a politician you trust, uh, you'll believe it because you don't have access to independent confirmation or disconfirmation. There is still, however, I would suggest in the United States, maybe more than any other country in the world, a, a true commitment to free speech. Why do you think that is? Well, it goes back a long time. So in our country, there was a rebellion against uh, the United Kingdom, England, when part of the rebellion was, hey, uh, we are born free and equal, and we get to say what we want. The freedom of speech is part of our cultural heritage, and that's a very good thing. The Civil War, uh, the attack on slavery, was partly promoted and entrenched a belief that people should be able to dissent, even from institutions and practices that have been longstanding. Certainly, the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s uh, entrenched further, a commitment to freedom of speech, and that is part of our culture. But we shouldn't exaggerate the commitment to freedom of speech. If someone perjures themselves, if someone says, I'll sell you this product, you'll never get cancer. If someone tells you, hey, uh, I saw my neighbor and my neighbor was uh, uh, stealing drugs from someone else who was another neighbor who was uh, using drugs, if that's false, that can be regulated too. So our basic commitment to freedom of speech uh, does have some limits. Well, you do give this example in the book about the time you went to buy a car and the fellow who sold you the car said, oh, I'm going to give you such a sweetheart deal because we never sell cars on Saturday. And then you, he gave you the sweetheart deal. You bought the car. <laughs> you asked him about it and he said, oh, God, we do our best business on, on Saturday. So, of course. Now, that's not a... Sorry, go ahead. 
He was a great car seller. He said, <laughs> you know, it's Saturday. I'm not going to sell any cars. I'm going to give you a spectacular deal. And he gave me a deal which probably wasn't spectacular at all. But since he had prefaced it by saying, we don't sell any cars on Saturday, I thought to myself, lucky me. He's giving me a great bargain. And then an hour later, when I drove the car up, I said, I'm glad I could sell you a car on Saturday. He said, you kidding? He forgot what he had told me an hour earlier. He said, you kidding? Saturday's our best day. I'm going to sell 30 cars today. He was a good car seller and a liar. He was a good seller and a liar. But of course, this sort of gets into this issue about some lies which are serious and problematic and some which aren't that much. Which category would you put that one in? I think that was more like trying to make me be well inclined to buy a car from him. It wasn't fraud. It wasn't damaging. It wasn't wonderful. It didn't make me like him more, but it was uh, within the bounds. If he had told me, buy this car, it has better gas mileage than the record shows, and you're not going to pay anything for gas, that would have been fraud. If he told me something about safety features that was false, that would have been fraud. If he had told me something about how if I use this car, I would never get heart disease because the car has spectacular anti-heart disease magic, that wouldn't have been credible. So maybe it wouldn't have been fraud, but uh, it would have been worse than what he did. Well, of course, it all raises questions about whether or not you can regulate lies and falsehoods while at the same time fostering free speech. And let me just read this a uh, short excerpt from your book, and then uh, come back at you with a question. My first goal here, you write, is to deepen the foundations of what many people find to be a jarring idea. In general, falsehoods ought not to be censored or regulated, even if they are lies. Free societies protect them. Public officials should not be allowed to act as the truth police. A key reason is that we cannot trust officials to separate truth from falsehood. Their own judgments are unreliable, and their own biases get in the way. If officials are licensed to punish falsehoods, they will end up punishing dissent. This notion of trying to find an unbiased censor who can make the important judgments about what's okay and what's not, is this the prime reason why you think we should just sort of let outright lies and falsehoods go? Well, I'm not really quite there in terms of letting outright falsehoods and lies go. I, I aim to write the book as a kind of manifesto in favor of regulating lies and many falsehoods. So I started the book thinking we have this horrific problem in democracies even of lies and falsehoods causing terrible harm, and we ought to do something about that. The more I worked on the book, the more I thought the idea that this was a manifesto in favor of protecting against lies and falsehoods was too simple, and hence the passage you read, where the idea that goes back to John Stuart Mill and John Milton of allowing a lot of breathing space for falsehoods, even if they're intentional lies, that's actually a good idea. So to have that abstract commitment to freedom of speech, even if someone says, let's say on a date, you know, I won a medal, I was the greatest track star in high school. Or if they say, if they're running for office, uh, I was first in my class, when actually they weren't first in their class. To say that can be a, deemed a criminal offense, we wouldn't want that in a free society, and we wouldn't want to live in a society that isn't a free society. Still, the part of my motivation which was to say we need to do more than we now do to control damage and falsehoods and lies, uh, that is a thrust of the book. So the book, it's a little like uh, music where it has a theme and a counter theme. The theme is freedom is important. If you ban lies and falsehoods, good luck maintaining freedom and democracy. At the same time, if you say uh, anything goes, you can lie however you want, then we're in big, big trouble. And we are in big, big trouble. So the balance between the theme and the counter theme is what gives the book, uh, I hope, uh, a productive tension. Uh, indeed it does. Uh, can I just sort of um, drill a little deeper here on this issue of which lies and which falsehoods you find cross the line and are particularly problematic? Well, the first thing you want to know is how dangerous is it? So if someone says on a date, I was a track star, 
then the person you're dating might like you a little bit more or not, but nothing horrible is likely to happen. If you say to a friend that, you know what, let's go swimming, it's going to be a beautiful day, and you kind of know it's going to get cold and rainy, don't make that a crime. It's not so harmful. But if you sell a product saying this product has all sorts of medicinal properties, which it actually lacks, or if you sell people a product lying about certain character safety features it actually has, that's harmful. Then people are going to get hurt, really hurt, possibly more than hurt, possibly killed. And that can be regulated. If you have a politician who says things about his or her background, it's kind of an exaggeration, then let the free market work on that. But if you have someone that actually says that my opponent is, let's say, uh, a former uh, felon who spent five years in jail, uh, that's a more interesting case. I'm not sure whether that should be regulable, but you could devise a case when we're talking about libel under standard North American standards. And the idea that libel can be regulated, that seems compatible with a system of free expression, depending again on the definition. Health and safety are two categories of falsehoods and lies where the harm is large enough and the danger is serious enough that to think about regulation is, is not a terrible in which category would you put Donald Trump's comments that the election was stolen from him? I think that shouldn't be regulated. We're talking about a political actor. It shouldn't be regulated by government. We're talking about a political actor who is saying something which I believe he knows to be false. Still, to regulate that, to say he's committed a crime by lying about the election, that way lies a kind of madness by which we are criminalizing the lies and falsehoods of political officials, and that doesn't really have a very good heritage. On the other hand, for Facebook and Twitter, and this is a large part of the theme of the book, for Facebook and Twitter to take down lies from politicians in cases like that, that's very thinkable, and it doesn't pose the same kind of danger that is posed when the prosecutor starts wielding the criminal law against people. Do I hear you saying then that you do not think it problematic that Donald Trump had his Twitter account shut down? I think that is not a, a horrific uh, problem in a free society where private entities, including Twitter and newspapers and magazines, are allowed to do a lot of stuff that fits their own conception of what their role in society is. So I'm not sure I approve of that, but I do think it's within the domain of the reasonable. And for Twitter and Facebook to be thinking really hard about such things as warnings, reminders, putting things in context, putting a big word on certain statements, and that word is false, that's a good thing for freedom. That's not a bad thing for freedom. And for taking down things that cause imminent risks, as Facebook uh, does, uh, risks of harm, that's a good thing. And since Facebook, as powerful as it is, it isn't the government, it legitimately has more freedom to maneuver than the government would in protecting against the adverse effects of lies. How troubled are you, though, that Donald Trump has had his Twitter privileges taken away but the head of al-Qaeda or the head of ISIS still manages to hang on to his. Well, it's exactly what line should be drawn would require lots of immersion in particular facts. And uh, to think about how to deal with one political leader or another is completely fair. To have an offhand judgment would be reckless. What I would say is that uh, we know what our theory should be. It should ask the following kinds of questions. How much harm is being done by the speech? Is it an intentional falsehood or an innocent falsehood? How corrective would be counter speech, meaning how useful would counter speech be? Typically it is. And how imminent is the harm? And how um, how grave is the harm? That's, that's the kind of questions we want to ask. And we're talking about a terrorist leader who's recruiting activity for terrorism. The idea of allowing that on a private platform, that's not a very good idea. Not necessarily because it's false, it may or may not contain a falsehood, but because it's dangerous and private entities do well to reduce risks of danger.
What about the speech Donald Trump gave on the 6th of January near Capitol Hill? How, what category would you put that in, in terms of harm caused and therefore needed to be censored, regulated, whatever? I'd put that speech in the category of worse than bad and dangerous and um, uh, life-threatening. Uh, whether we should at the time think of a president of the United States who's making statements like that as a basis for, let's say, at the time, criminal intervention is extremely doubtful, whether after the fact uh, uh, criminal inquiry is legitimate or not would depend a lot on particulars. I want to give any politician a wide berth with respect to uh, statements to supporters, whether the president uh, passed the bounds of what is legitimate, you'd want to know a lot about what the particular statute says, and you'd want to know a lot about the context. But a very strong presumption in favor of allowing uh, statements, even uh, you know, worse than bad statements by political leaders. It's interesting that it was uh, probably eight decades ago that Winston Churchill said, you know, a lie can get halfway around the world by the time the truth has a chance to put its pants on. And <laughs> obviously, this is well before the days of uh, digital communications and social media. That, that is really the case and on steroids today. I wonder whether or how all of that affects your thinking about this issue. Yes. So I am less pro freedom of speech than the Supreme Court is today. That is, certain libels that are not under current standards um, punishable by damage actions, I would allow punishment by damage actions. So if someone says something that is um, false and damaging to reputation, to say that that person has to has to say it was wrong or has to pay a small amount of money. It seems to me that's within the bounds of what's acceptable in a free society. And many nations that are highly respectful of freedom of speech uh, very much agree with me on this. So it is true that the speed of uh, damaging falsehood, saying someone is a criminal, someone is uh, you know, a horrible actor and not like bad in movies, but a horrible person. That, um, uh, that, that is unprecedented. And it's also the case we know something about the human mind that Churchill didn't know, which is that if you were told something, and if I tell you in real time that what I just told you is false, you will, in some part of your mind, remember it is true, even weeks and months later. It's called truth bias, and it casts, I think, a new light on a lot of what we're discussing, where a statement that is false gets under the kind of skin uh, or, or the surface of the human mind, and that makes it particularly damaging, where even people who know on reflection that it's false in some part of their mind think, oh, that's true. And that puts a special burden, I think, on social media platforms and others, not simply to label things false, but to take the most damaging ones down. And it also puts the whole area of libel in a somewhat different light from the light in which we've looked at it over the last few decades. So if I were to say Cass Sunstein is certainly not a Toronto Raptors fan, just by saying that alone and putting Sunstein and Raptors in the same sentence, I've really violated you there, haven't I? Not so terribly, because <laughs> I'm a Raptors fan, admittedly, that is a terrible, terrible thing, but it's <laughs> not the very worst thing in the world. If you said Cass Sunstein doesn't like the Boston Red Sox, I think that would be unquestionably libelous and a terrible thing. And I much regret that I uttered that sentence because some people will remember it as true, even though I said it to illustrate a point. I will try to disabuse them of the notion from here on forward because we know it is just not the case. Let's, um, let's play a short clip here. This is from Timothy Snyder, well-known Yale historian. Uh, we're gonna play this clip and then come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. Either we have to say, look, Factuality doesn't arrive naturally, and this is and this is a this is a revelation of you know of 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 the 21st century too. We would like to think that the the the, the free market, normal human exchange will make the facts rise to the top, but it doesn't. 
it just that just isn't true. I mean, there's a long tradition in liberal thinking which says, hey, let's just have a free exchange. The truth will always win. It doesn't. We have to say, look, if you want truth, you have to create it. You have to manufacture it. This is a very uh, disappointing notion that, that the truth maybe will not out in the end. What's your view on whether he's right that Sunshine's just not going to get the job done anymore? I think he's partly right. Uh, we've succeeded in coming up with vaccines to um, help with the pandemic. And that's partly a tribute to at least the scientific marketplace of ideas. Uh, we have, with respect to any number of technological developments, uh, truth has won out that this makes for a good iPhone or a good laptop, and that doesn't. With respect to many things that people now believe that are true about how to make yourself healthy or safe, uh, the marketplace of ideas has not worked terribly. So the course of human history is not like the marketplace of ideas stinks or it fails, but the idea that it is uh, universally reliable or we can count on it to correct uh, damaging falsehoods, that, that is a truthful statement. I think what's nice is the truth of that statement is increasingly supported in the marketplace of ideas. And I don't know if that's testimony to the statement or a contradiction of the statement. Hmm. Um, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity to get your advice on something because I know that on my own personal Facebook page, I promoted some months ago an interview I had with a, with a doctor on the issue of vaccines and so on. And some anti-vaxxer, you know, QAnon type of person said something, you know, quite ridiculous on my page. And I immediately got an email from a doctor who said, Steve, you got to take that down. Take that comment out. And I had one of those Cass Sunstein moments where I thought, what do I do here? Do I censor or do I hope that truth will be the best disinfectant, sunshine will be the best disinfectant? What should I have done? I think for you as a public figure, um, a statement that is false and potentially damaging, uh, to take that down wouldn't be a terrible thing. I think either to allow it up or to take it down would be reasonable. If you were the government and you were trying to put someone in jail because they made what, let's say, is just an innocent mistake, that would be a terrible thing. But to take it down, if, if your assessment is that it could be harmful, uh, you're a private citizen, that's one way you could exercise your freedom. For the record, I left it up and I just contradicted it. That's what I chose to do. Um, Cass Sunstein, we're really grateful that you came on tonight's program. Liars, falsehood, and free speech in an age of deception is your latest contribution to this issue, and we're delighted to have had you on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thanks. A great pleasure. In 2016, the Oxford Dictionary selected post-truth as its word of the year. One of the reasons was that the frequency of its usage increased by 2,000% year over year. It was defined as a condition in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Is that, however, a basis upon which democracy can really function on emotion rather than facts? Well, let's ask. In London, UK, Matthew Dancona. He's the author of Post-Truth, The New War on Truth and How to Fight Back. He's also editor and partner at Tortoise Media. In Socorro, New Mexico, Taylor Dotson, author of The Divide, How Fanatical Certitude is Destroying Democracy. He's also an associate professor at New Mexico Tech. And back here in Ontario's capital city, Robin Urbach, current affairs columnist with The Globe and Mail, and Navneet Halang, contributing columnist to the Toronto Star. And we're delighted to welcome all four of you onto our program tonight. And Navneet, as I say every couple of weeks here, we're really enjoying this collaboration with the Toronto Star. This is our sixth go at it, I think, and we've had some really great conversations, including the one we're about to have tonight. And just a reminder, uh, the definition of post-truth, when objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Matthew, I gather you were so concerned about this, you wrote the book about it. What concerns you in particular? Well, 
that book came out in 2017, and I remained un unfortunately uh, persuaded that the problem of post-truth is uh, all around us, and if anything, getting worse. And one of the reasons for that is, as you said in, in, in the Oxford Dictionary definition, that emotions are now uh, threatening the traditional primacy of that. Well, why is this happening? Partly, I think, because um, trust in institutions has declined precipitously, but also, and uh, very significantly, uh, because social media has made the algorithm, rather than traditional forms of, uh, of expert authority, the main driver of information. And what algorithms do is, is, is devise a, a virtual echo chamber in which people are fed with things that, as it were, give them dopamine hits that are like the things that they like already. So the traditional model of, of, of finding things out, which is you're constantly exposed to new and diverse sources of information, is being replaced by a model where you're constantly being reinforced in your, in your presuppositions and even your prejudices. And this is a really major threat to democratic discourse. And of course, it was one that uh, Donald Trump made massive use of. And even though he uh, barely, barely even pretended to manage the pandemic, he still managed to get 74 million votes in the presidential election, which shows you how powerful this new form of politics remains. Yes, but it's still fewer than 81 million votes, and we've got to remember that, too. Let me do an excerpt from your book, and then I'll come at you with a follow-up question. This is not a battle, you write, between liberals and conservatives. It is a battle between two ways of perceiving the world, two fundamentally different approaches to reality. And as between those two, you do have to choose. Are you content for the central value of the enlightenment of free societies and of democratic discourse to be trashed by charlatans or not? Okay, let's pull that apart. Who are the charlatans you're talking about there? Well, the charlatans are coming from all sorts of directions. They're the kind of they're the people that manipulate social media, but they're also, uh, I mean, one of the things that has become uh, even more disturbing, I think, in recent years has been the normalization of conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories used to be uh, largely confined to the fringe. They were often comical, uh, vaguely entertaining, not taken hugely seriously, but they have become a means of imposing some form of order on a world that can appear chaotic. And many of them are very sinister and involve uh, prejudice and bigotry and blaming ethnic groups, immigrants, and so on. So that's very concerning. The other thing that's very concerning is the explosive rise of pseudoscience, uh, which I think is, is, is very, very much uh, in the category of charlatans that I said said in the book, and it, that that again has threatened the uh, the traditional ideas that medicine is a is a is a formal system of authoritative knowledge, uh, whereas now you know the more di the more oddball, more eccentric, the more left field the 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 healing substances, the better it is for many people. Robin, let me get you to react to whether you share Matthew's concerns that appeals to emotion are extremely problematic in trying to develop public policy for society. Well, I think so. We can see it in all sorts of elements of society. I mean, it, it, it's not something new, however. I mean, we, we've seen the the power, the persuasive power of appeals to emotion, anxiety, tribalism for as long as humans have been around, especially pre-enlightenment when um, we didn't have germ theory and we didn't have ways of explaining the inexplicable. So the, pl the Black Plague comes, a bunch of people die, the Jews are seemingly okay. So there's this conspiracy theory developed that, okay, maybe the Jews are poisoning the wells. And now, of course, we know it had more to do with rituals around hand washing. But it was a way of explaining the inexplicable um, and, and scientific developments and the post-Enlightenment age really changed that, but not absolutely. I mean, in the 90s, there was panic about 
satanic ritual abuse in daycares. And in the 80s, there was panic about gay people and AIDS and, and potentially getting infected by touch or being in the same room. Um, and of course, in the Donald Trump area and in the post-Donald Trump area, era, um, conspiracy theories have really had their, their central time in the sun. And I think it's largely because of what Matthew said about the fact that um, you can find like-minded individuals so readily and so quickly quickly, um, and also by virtue of the fact that these conspiracy theories were really hoisted on a pedestal by the president. I mean, you had his press secretary come out and almost literally tell people, don't believe your lying eyes about um, the, the size of the inauguration crowd. And the president was saying, don't believe what you're hearing about COVID-19 and don't believe that Joe Biden um, actually won the election. And we saw the results of that. Navni, Robin is quite right when she points to the fact that this has been going on for decades. But I wonder whether, and you know, the internet and social media, uh, you write a great deal about, I wonder whether you think that social media has essentially put this, this effect of making public policy more through emotion than empirically provable facts on steroids, and therefore it is of greater concern. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it has. I, I think that one thing that we do need to be a little bit careful about is that the notion of the, the echo chamber is actually a bit more contested than, than perhaps we assume. Um, I think that we generally assume that, you know, that when you, you go online, you surround yourself with um, sort of similar views. Um, but it's actually one of the effects that, that perhaps we talk less about is the fact that you are bombarded constantly with actually opposing views rather than um, similar comforting views. And one of the effects that that has is that it destabilizes your worldview, right? Like if you, every time you sort of open up your social media, you're confronted with an opposing idea of reality, right? Anything from, um, you know, how does one solve a housing crisis? How does one deal with the COVID-19 crisis? Um, you know, to, to conceptions of, you know, medicine or, or you know, like the, the the tone and the tenor of history, um, those kinds of things, you constantly get hit with these sort of contrasting difficult ideas. And so I think, you know, it isn't just the question of the echo chamber that, that social media does. It, it actually, I think, produces a form of anxiety that I think fosters a, a desire for tribalism, right? It's, it's, it fosters this desire to find things that you can root your identity in. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons that we have seen this sort of rise of a, of a polarization based on feeling uh, rather than objective fact um, isn't just a question of echo chambers, but a question of, uh, of the way in which constantly contrasting views of reality are a threat to the stability of a worldview. Hmm. Taylor, let me set up this next question to you by reading an excerpt from your book, The Divide. And here we go. Could it be you right? Could it be that the ideal of truth is the problem, rather than the fact that people rarely live up to it. Does it ask too much of democracy to expect it not just to settle disputes imperfectly and tentatively, but also to validate an objective reality? What happens to democratic politics when truth becomes gospel, but no one can agree on the catechisms? You've asked some good questions there, so let's see. What happens to democratic politics in your judgment when truth is put on a pedestal? Well, I think it's uh, some of the issues that have been pointed out already that um, really my view is, again, that there's a lot of history of, of sort of a looseness with the facts and even outright falsehoods motivating politics. Uh, I mean, how many of America's wars were based on um, total fabrications? Um, but really, it's, it's, it's what was pointed out earlier, that it's a, it's a crisis of trust, that citizens are... Uh, they mistrust their government. They mistrust elected officials more and more. You've seen this precipitous decline in their trust for each other and we even willingness to live near one another if they have differing political views. And I think it's not because people don't care about the truth, but because they care about the truth too much. They care about it so much that they think knowing the truth can replace doing politics. And you, you see this in, in sort of haughty lines that get thrown out, like Paul Krugman likes to say, reality has a liberal bias, or some of the more questionable pundits on the right will say, liberalism is a mental disorder. That there's this tendency, because we have this, we tend to, you know, we're, we're sort of idolizing truth, idolizing fact, that we tend to diagnose our op opponents, not understand them. And when we do that, when we say, the only reason somebody can disagree with me must be because they're ignorant, must be because they're illiterate, or even worse, maybe they're brainwashed or corrupt, we don't make any attempt to understand them. And that makes 
debate, negotiation, compromise, all those things that make democracy work uh, look like a fool's errand, that we, it's just compromising with a madman. And we need to remember that democracy is about how do we help very different people, very diverse groups with different interests and even possibly different realities learn how to live together peaceably. So we don't need, in my view, a politics of truth, but a politics of connection. Yeah, Navneet, I always thought that's what was democracy was about as well, is figuring out how very different people can sort of resolve their differences without going to war all the time. You have written, I'll pluck this from one of your columns, the division between left and right isn't disagreement about policy, it's about competing understanding of what reality actually is. So if that's the case, do we not have that much to debate anymore? No, I mean, I, I think that that is what democracy is, right? That, that in, in, you know, sort of there was a, a literary theorist in Cal Bakhtin who, who said that the, the aestheticization of politics is war, which is to say that, that when you kind of push the difference in politics to its most extreme form, you, you end up in, in military conflict. And I think that the, the function of democratic d debate is to, is to actually um, sort of foreclose that, that, that inevitability, right? It's, it, it's to actually deal with reality. And so, but I think that, that one of the things that has struck me over the past, you know, sort of decade or two, or, or two decades or so is that the distinction between left and right is, is, is a distinction on some level of, of, of faith. Or, or, or a distinction between notions of, of reality or, or, or ideas about what a society should be. Um, and I think that, 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 what, that what that means is, is um, that um, the debate is the only way uh, to sort of overcome that, 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 that contrast. Um, and I think that um, it's not that we should give up on, on debate, rather it's that we should sort of double down on, on how do you think about um, policy as a negotiation of people with differing conceptions of reality. Well, Robin, one of the institutions that presumably promotes and provokes debate in society is journalism. You're a journalist, and I want to ask you what role you think journalism plays in this predicament we're talking about tonight, given the fact that for so much of journalism nowadays, it's about clicks, it's about clickbait, it's about an emotional as opposed to intellectual engagement with your readers, viewers, listeners, which you know, can have these adverse effects that we're talking about here. What's your take on that? I think it's a real challenge for mainstream news organizations, um, particularly understanding the level of distrust in certain uh, segments of society for mainstream news, along with big tech and other seemingly overarching institutions. Um, it's something that we're constantly grappling with. How do we reach an audience that fundamentally doesn't trust us? And I think part of what we need to do is understand the audience that we're not re reaching and understand the fears and emotions of that audience. I think debate is good. Discourse is great. It's great to counter um, someone's perceived reality with facts and figures and investigations and all sorts of things. But I'm mindful of, for example, a few years ago, I was working on a column about vaccine hesitancy. And there have been so many columns written about um, the effectiveness of the MMR vaccine, for example, and um, the relative rarity of adverse effects and the zero connection to autism. And in, in writing my column, and I didn't want to repeat everything that had been written before, I, I went down a rabbit hole of anti-vaccination Facebook groups. And I really dove into them and I started looking into them and I noticed one post by a mother who posted videos of her son's deterioration, what she attributed to vaccine um, injury. And it was a really compelling video and I was watching it and I was kind of finding myself getting sucked in and I was thinking, okay, I get it. Like, I, I get it. We can throw a whole bunch of facts and figures and statistics and journal articles at people, and we can write these editorials in the newspaper telling people how safe vaccines are, for example, but this mother's Facebook post about her son losing his language and showing him not responding to his name when he used to respond to his name and stemming with his hands, that's far more powerful. And even for someone like me who knows all the research and believes strongly in the, the, the efficacy of vaccines, and I know they're safe, that video sticks in my head even all these years later. So I think we need to understand what it is 
that people who have these ideas and who distrust mainstream organizations or mainstream science or investigations or big tech or all of these other things, we really need to understand what it is that they're seeing, the emotional impact it's having, and and what it's doing to them psychologically before we can even attempt to counter it. Matthew, given that example that Robin just gave, what hope, in your view, do empirically provable facts have against an emotional tug at the heartstrings, the likes of which we just heard? Well, Robin's spot on. I mean, uh, you can't batter someone into believing something different with a sort of uh, bombardment of facts. It doesn't work. In fact, a brilliant example of that was the Brexit referendum in the UK, where the, the campaign to stay in the European Union was entirely based on uh, a long list of statistics and, and facts about you know, this, this sector of the economy and that sector of the economy. Whereas the, uh, the campaign to leave was based on a very, very persuasive, emotional campaign, taking back control, very simple, and it worked. Um, so my, my feeling is that if you want to maintain some idea of the truth, you have to um, pay heed to that. And it, that involves, in turn, I think two things. One is um, something that binds um, empiricism and empathy, which is the, the long lost spirit of curiosity which is showing respect and interest in other people's points of view without necessarily uh, de deferring to, to them, you know, without necessarily agreeing them, but, but actually showing them the respect of hearing them, uh, as in Robin's example. And the second, which I think is, which kind of overarches this whole debate is, is various forms of literacy, that the kind of literacy we, we teach our children at the moment is, is, is insufficient. We need to teach digital literacy, scientific literacy for people who aren't going to become scientists and so on. And these are these are gentle skills rather than, um, as it were, authoritarian skills in the classroom <laughs> that, that, people, that people will need increasingly in, a, in the world that we, we've been discussing. Well, that dovetails nicely to my next question for Taylor, because there was a... Let me share these results from a recent poll with you. Here was the question. Do you think the goal of politics is more about enacting good public policy or ensuring the country's survival as we know it. Only 25% of Republicans say it's about enacting good public policy. Half of them thought it's about ensuring the existence of the country as we know it. Now, I guess I've got to ask, what kind of public debate on issues is possible when everything is seen as an existential crisis? Yeah, those, those, are, those are really scary numbers. And... Um... <sighs> Yeah, I mean, what I'd argue in the book is that sort of signaling that we're perhaps on the precipice of what's called the polarization death spiral. And that, and that occurs when people in a nation stop seeing political opponents just as opponents, people that believe and want different things, but they start seeing them as enemies of the country, enemies of the people. And uh, even when I was starting the book in 2017, I had these worries that, yeah, maybe maybe America's too far gone, right? Like maybe we're too down into this spiral to pull it back. And, and it's really difficult to have a conversation with people that are, are that worried about what they see as their whole world, perhaps no longer existing. I mean, I have family members that are, that are of that view. And, um, you know, and we want to avoid, you know, usually these countries get in these situations that it's either violent fracture uh, or compromise, or sometimes it's violent fracture and then they compromise afterwards. And so the thing is, is to think is there's, there's nothing that we can do except to, except to try, right? Except to try to do what Robin has been pointing out and saying, really trying to understand where people are coming from, because often it's not, it's not really about the facts so much, right? If, if some people that are vaccine hesitant, it's not the, the MMR study that swayed them. It was already pre-existing things. There's already problems with our healthcare system. Um, for instance, the two main groups that are skeptical of the COVID vaccine um, are healthcare workers and African-Americans in the United States. And those are the groups that have actually been disproportionately impacted, disproportionately harmed by COVID. And so it's really surprising to say, well, why would they be um, skeptical of the vaccine? They should, they should want it. But the experience of healthcare workers was that they uh, didn't feel like they were given proper precautions for weeks or months working to battle this. And African Americans tend to be treated unfairly by the healthcare system. So their hesitancy, if we just say it's illiteracy, that we're missing that really they're telling us something very important. They're telling us that there are major problems that 
about our healthcare system that they feel alienated from, that they feel doesn't have their well-being as a priority. And so we have to dig deeper and to find those areas where we are willing to compromise, right? We're, maybe we're not willing to compromise on vaccines and the scheduling, but we can compromise by saying, how do we make the healthcare system or the country feel more inclusive? Let me pick up on that with Robin, because, and uh, Robin, I'm gonna give you a different example. I, I well remember Barack Obama when he was president trying to convince people that terrorism was not as significant a thing, for example, as car accidents, that if you look at the empirically provable facts, you are far more likely to die in a car accident than you are with a terrorist attack. That is true. It is provably true. It's also irrelevant to somebody who's terrified about being blown up in a movie theater. So I wonder whether, in your view, liberals have to get beyond the notion of we can win every argument with facts when we realize that there's more to this than facts. Right. Um, and I think to a certain extent that's been proven in other examples. If you think of, for example, um, Canada's immigration policies, if we think back to 2015, the federal election, um, there was a big wrench thrown into it. And this is a, kind of a crude way of saying it. But um, I think a month or two months before that election took place, um, that photo of three-year-old Alan Curdy just spread around the world. Um, this is the young was, boy who was washed up on the beach, face down, had drowned. Right. Um, and the, the photo of him just sort of flashed around the world. And it wasn't as if that photo told us anything that we didn't know before. We knew that Syria was in crisis. We knew that people were dying. We knew that little kids were getting injured. We knew that people were fleeing for their lives. But there was something about that photo, a little boy face down in the sand wearing Velcro shoes that I think every parent has bought for their three-year-old, um, that really resonated. And it changed the course of the Canadian election because suddenly we had the Liberals promising, okay, well, if, if we're elected, we are going to resettle 25,000 Syrian refugees, which they did. Um, I'm not sure that that promise would have been made had that photo not gone viral, had we not learned that the family was intending to move to Canada, which is why it really resonated in Canada. And I'm not sure the Liberals would have had support for that promise had the public not seen that. So I think liberals and progressives can also use, and it sounds like manipulation, and to a certain extent it is, but they can also use these emotional appeals to affect policy in a way. So, I mean, saying you're more likely to die in a car crash is all fine and good, but telling an individual story about someone dying in a car crash and comparing that to the incidence of terrorist attacks, well, that might actually make change. One of the things, though, Matthew, one of the reasons why we're doing these programs every other Thursday is that we're trying to encourage people to have conversations about democracy and how we can make our democracies better. And I, I have to tell you, I just wonder how we help make that happen if, and I don't think the numbers are comparable in Canada, but certainly in the United States, if half the people believe that every argument about every issue is an existential threat to the future of the country as they understand it, where's the opening for dialogue exactly? Well, uh, it, it, it depends what kind of dialogue you're talking about. There are healthy forms of dialogue. Uh, democracy is essentially that. And then there are unhealthy forms of dialogue of the sort you're describing. Um, I think... Um, one of the ways in which you appeal to people who don't necessarily uh, share all your beliefs or indeed any of them is through narrative and, uh, and story. And I think that uh, progressives tend to be less good at this um, than those on the right. Um, there have been great storytellers, of course, like Kennedy and Harvey Milk and uh, Dr. King and others. Um, and, and, and indeed, uh, Barack Obama told a great story about America and its past and its future. And it's when progressives do that, that they, they, they offer a kind of, they, 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 yes, they base, they root their appeal in facts and in enlightenment values, but they don't provide a sort of dull, arid bill of fare. They offer some sort of pathway into which all citizens can, can slipstream. And this is a very, very big ask at the moment, but I'm, I'm not entirely pessimistic about it. I think 
one of the opportunities as we move out of the pandemic is is to kind of build these 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 kind of narratives if if we if we have the the you know the sense of the imperative and the sense of urgency well navneed i think w w one of the we, you and I both, frankly, all of us here, we spend a lot of time covering very complicated issues and we rely on experts to kind of guide us through, given their expertise, what they believe these issues are going to lead to. And, you know, there's no better one than climate change, for example. We are not capable, given our background and training, of assessing the competing claims about climate change uh, than people who've spent their whole lives studying these issues. In which case, are emotions a more democratic way, if you like, of considering the future on these? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's a difficult it's a difficult question. I mean, I think that one of the things that, that we've been sort of pointing out today, I think all of us sort of agree, is that emotion is a kind of a core part of the political process, right? So the 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 appeal to sort of the idea of the nation, you know, through through narrative or the idea of, of, of um, uh, you know, the, a collective sense of, of, of identity that, that overcomes political difference um, is sort of a, a endemic to, to, to the political process. So that question of feeling, I think, um, is, is, is inescapable. I think that, that what we have to be wary of is that, is that emotion and feeling can be co-opted and sort of redirected um, very easily. So, so is emotion more democratic or is it less democratic? I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure that, that the, it's, it's a, it, it's a question of less or, or, or more as much as, um, the, the, perhaps one of the upsides of, of this moment is that it allows us to recognize that emotion is a part of the democratic process. And, and therefore, as Matthew, uh, you know, had just said, the, the, the question of how we position things, how we uh, frame things in a narrative becomes a fundamental part of how you think about politics. It's not just about good policy. It's about how do you present that to the public? Well, Robin, fess up here. W when you write a column, do you want people to email you back and say, wow, you made some really good intellectual arguments there and I'm on side with you? Or would you prefer to have people say, man, you got me right in the heart, right in the gut on that one, and I may go grab a picket sign and, and demonstrate as a result? <laughs> Which is it? My, what I consider to be the best compliment or what I like to hear if I've, I've written a column and I get feedback, I, I want to hear someone say, you know, from your headline, I thought I would completely disagree with you, but you changed my mind. And whether mm. I did that through emotion or argument, um, that doesn't really matter to me. It, it tells me that I'm trying to reach the audience that I want. I don't want people to tell me that I took the words out of their mouths because they have mouths. Like they can say their own words if they want to. But I think the way we progress as a society is if we open our minds to other ideas. And that's why I choose to read the columnists I disagree with first at the beginning of the day. And I like to watch um, the networks that I think are totally out to lunch. Of course, not this one. But <laughs> um, I want to turn on Fox News to see what they're talking about. I want to see what's happening on MSNBC. I want to read the columnists that I very rarely agree with because I want to challenge my beliefs. I think the challenge is reaching people who have no interest in doing that. I think that's a really hard thing to do, especially when you're talking about people who are so far gone in QAnon conspiracy theories and those sorts of things. It's a real challenge that we have to confront. But when it comes to my work personally, I want to have that dialogue. I want someone to change my mind. I want to change someone else's mind. I think that's the healthiest exchange of ideas. And whether it's through emotion or through argument, hopefully it's some combination of both. Amen. That is a beautiful thing in a democracy if through a superior argument or emotion you can manage to get somebody to be open to seeing an issue a different way. Taylor, let's finish up on this. We're down to our last minute. You write, the tensions between truth and democracy are here to stay. What are some of the ways in your judgment that they can be accommodated more productively than clearly is the case today? Yeah, um, I think there's several ways. I can only go through a few of them here. Um, but my, in my book, I argue that when we try to make politics about truth, we're putting the cart before the horse. That if we do good democratic politics, the truth part will handle itself. We'll end up with intelligent policies. And so a lot of the things I recommend is, one is to not focus so much on what we think we know, but what we don't know. 
to emphasize the uncertainty in all our political questions because they're far more complex than most of us care to admit. And our proposed solutions are less certain to work than we want to admit either. Um, and the other thing I've already talked about, focusing on people's expertise in terms of their experience, right? I, I talked about that already in terms of COVID and why people are vaccine hesitant. And the other, one of the other aspects is something that's been just, just discussed in that last question is recognizing that people have very different value systems and those value systems are legitimate or we have to at least pretend that they're legitimate, that we believe that they're legitimate in, to, in order to do politics. I think if I'm gonna pick on the left here, very often the left portrays issues as if the only value that matters is, is this equal or is a, a historically marginalized group being harmed. And psychological studies find that there's actually a, an array of different moral intuitions that motivate people and that sort of core to their being. And so if issues just get presented with one, even if they're trying to be fair to the facts, if it's presented with like one sort of flavor of morality in it, um, people are going to feel excluded they're, and they're not going to be persuaded. That's Taylor Dotson, along with Matthew Dancona, Robin Urbach, Navnita Lang. It's great having all four of you on TVO tonight for this Democracy Agenda show. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. And we should remind you, we'll have another installment of the Democracy Agenda two weeks from tonight. And as part of our joint initiative between TVO and the Toronto Star, you can also check out my column on post-truth in today's Toronto Star. And that is the agenda for Thursday, April 1st, 2021. Tomorrow, we'll give way to a special presentation here on TVO. Since actual travel isn't really available right now, we've got the world broadcast premiere of the slow documentary, Tripping the Niagara, that literally gives you a bird's eye view of Southern Ontario's Niagara region, including the wondrous Niagara Falls. That's tomorrow beginning at 7 p.m. for four glorious hours or you can stream it anytime at tvo.org slash documentaries. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you back here on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.